Welcome aboard the World War II submarine USS Pampanito, SS-383. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's address to Congress, December 8, 1941. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States ship Pampanito was built in 1943 at the Portsmouth Navy Yard in New Hampshire. The role of U.S. submarines was to cut off the flow of raw materials to Japan. The submarine fleet was instrumental in the Allied victory in the Pacific, far beyond its cost to the United States. Today, the Pampanito is being preserved as a memorial to the submarine service of the U.S. Navy, which we proudly call the Silent Service. Let's head below now to learn more about life aboard a wartime submarine. We knew that we would be going into the Pacific. We didn't know where our uh, war patrols would take us. Our survival rate was the least of uh, any group, Army, Navy, or Marine Corps. We had about 24% casualties on people that actually went on patrol. This is one of the two torpedo rooms on Pampanito, the after torpedo room. It smelled of oil. Diesel oil. All your clothes, the whole ship smells like diesel fuel, wherever I was. They knew a submarine sailor by the smell. Take a look at the four large bronze torpedo tubes. We had six tubes in the forward room and four tubes in the aft room. It was 24 torpedoes. Torpedo room, and if you couldn't get to sleep, the rocking, the movement of the boat would put you to sleep. And I had as my bedfellows a torpedo on one side and a torpedo above me. Torpedoman First Class Robert Bennett. We had two kinds of torpedoes. The steam torpedoes, they're very fast. The torpedoes you see here are steam torpedoes. They're called Mark 14s and had two speed settings, 31 and 46 knots. The others were what they called Mark 18s. They were electric. The advantage to those was there wasn't any bubbles from the wake when they were running and they were quiet, but they were slow. The Mark 18's top speed was 29 knots. Step forward into the maneuvering room. You're looking at the propulsion control stand. In the maneuvering room. And that's where they control the engine speed and the load on the engine. This is where speed changes and direction changes of the propellers take place. These levers were used to switch the electricity from the submarine's generators to charge the batteries or to power the main propulsion motors. The submarine's electric motors drove the twin propellers. Electrician's mate O.D. Hawkins. You have uh, two men that are on the main control cubicle, a port operator and a starboard operator. The signal comes from the bridge on speeds like one-third forward, one-third reverse, charge the batteries. So we had control of the speed of the engines, how the electricity was taken from the generators either to the batteries or to the main motors. The submarine was always operated by electrical power. The diesel engine generators powered the motors when the sub was on the surface. It ran on storage battery power when it was submerged. Being a uh, battery-powered submarine, diesel battery, we had to surface every night and charge batteries. The fastest the boat could go submerged was about nine knots, but this would drain the batteries in less than an hour. At slower speeds, she could go farther. On either side of this room are two of the submarine's four main engines. When she was running on the surface, Pampanito's maximum speed was 21 knots, or about 24 miles per hour. And when the engines were running, this room was one of the loudest places on the submarine. 
look toward the middle of the room. You'll see a ladder leading up to a deck access hatch. Just forward of this is another round opening. This is one of the hull valves that supplied the boat's air via the main induction. The main induction is a monstrous hole way up front of the ship at the bridge that drew in air through a 36 inch valve. Let's move on. You can see part of the upper crankshaft at the forward end of the starboard engine through the glass cover. This is the forward engine room. It housed the other two main diesel engines, Chester Bienkowski. Look against the wall at the far end of the room. You'll see two stainless steel barrel-shaped objects, the evaporators. The sub's fresh water had to be made by distilling seawater. Look to your left at the crew's washroom and shower. When we first would depart from port, we would uh, have food stashed all over, and it wasn't unusual to have some in the showers. Let's move on. Directly below this deck was one of the ship's two main storage batteries. This level is the main enlisted men's berthing area. There are 36 bunks in this room. We had hot bunks. We had more men than we had bunks. We had two bunks for every three men. I mean, the third man was always on watch. Look between the bunks for the small square lockers built into the walls. Not a lot of storage space for two months at sea. Sailors would unzip their mattress covers and stow their Navy uniforms inside. They didn't use them much on patrol. My name is Joseph Eichner, and I was one of the cooks aboard the submarine. I worked from, uh, let's say, from 5.30 in the morning till uh, 6.30 at night. Well into the night, the baker, he would bake uh, all cakes and cookies and rolls and that sort of thing. They say a submarino ate better than anybody in the Navy. Just forward of the tables is the galley or kitchen. <laughs> this is where all the food was prepared. Breakfast is uh, French toast or fried eggs and bacon or sausages. And then noon meal, we'd have pork chops or ham or... Uh, chicken or steak. We usually had french fries. And when you fed the whole crew, 85 men, you had to peel a lot of potatoes. Step into the control room. Look to your left into the radio room. The device that looks like a typewriter is actually the top secret coding machine, the ECM Mark II. It was used to encode and decode messages. Radar officer William Bruckert. Find the panel of red and green lights on the port side of the room. This is the hull opening indicator panel, nicknamed the Christmas tree. Oh, the Christmas tree was very important. The green lights would come on when everything was in its proper position. You had to have all green lights, of course, when you submerged. To dive the submarine, vents were opened in the top of the ballast tanks. This allowed air to escape and seawater to enter through the flood ports in the bottom of the tanks. Dive, dive. As the tanks flooded, the boat submerged. Look at the large white wheels to the left of the Christmas tree. The plainsmen sat here during dives and when the boat was submerged. The three lookouts and the officer of the deck had to get from your perch up on the bridge down to the ladder that goes to the conning tower, down the ladder to the control room within 30 seconds. We tried to get to periscope depth, which would be 60 feet, in 30 seconds. Let's move on to the forward battery, or officer's quarters. Sometimes the area is referred to as officer's country. On your right is the ship's office. This area housed eight officers, plus the executive and commanding officers. Just ahead are their staterooms. Radar officer Richard Sherlock. The big thing was developing, I think, a sense of 
confidence among the crew that you were competent as an officer. On your right, you'll see Commanding Officer Pete Summers' stateroom. The CO had a writing desk, deep depth gauge, and a repeater compass so he could track the sub's course at all times. Further along on the left is the ward room where officers ate, met, and passed the little free time they had. Richard Sherlock. I don't remember there being a crossword between the officers. Uh, most of us back and forth used our first names. I'm sure the crew had nicknames for all of us that they didn't use in our presence. Step into the forward torpedo room. Step into the room. The sonarman would be the first to hear an approaching enemy ship. We were severely depth charged, you know, in the one patrol. We had a sound operator, and he had his headset on, and he could listen. You could hear ships like 30,000 yards away or so. And he'd say, they're pinging on us. In other words, they were sending a sound. When they'd ping, the sonar would come down and bounce off. When they bounce it off you, they know you're there. This guy would be speaking on the phone, you know. They're pinging on us, they're making a run and then you could hear the big propellers of that ship above, you know. The boat would be rigged for what they call silent running. Everything was turned off that could be turned off. You had no air conditioning, uh, fans, or anything like that. The humidity would immediately go over 100%. The perspiration just ran off. I've ever been really frightened. If they're gonna get you, they're gonna get you. They dropped, I think, five depth charges, which were extremely close. The sound was indescribable. It was so loud. You heard a real thump. I mean, a real thump. What a hell of a clank. The uh, light bulbs shattered. Uh, the cork that the boat was lined with flew off the walls. They darn near got us. That old statement about there not being uh, atheists in foxholes, it's true there aren't any atheists under depth charge either. You pray. Everybody has a maker. You pray to Look up. The large hatch overhead, in the center of the compartment, is the escape trunk. It was designed to permit the crew to escape if the submarine were disabled in shallow water. We're now on the forward part of the submarine. Pampanito's guns, including the large wet mount gun to your left, were made to be submerged. Look up at the bridge. The periscope shears are the tall gray structures. On either side of them, surrounded by metal railings, are the lookout stands. When you're on the surface, you're out looking for whatever may be in any way a hazard to the ship. Pampanito sped to Saipan, the nearest American base. Only one man was lost on the way. Let's move aft toward the gangway. When you reach the gangway, turn to look back toward the bridge. The two round doors below the bridge are ammunition storage lockers. The hatch to your right leads down to the crew's mess. It was the main entrance to the boat. During World War II, Pampanito was credited with sinking six enemy ships. Captain Edward Beach. <laughs> 